So today we're going to do a pretty interesting video that actually doesn't involve too much of the microcontroller. We're not going to be learning a whole lot of new things with the microcontroller itself, but we're going to be doing something pretty awesome. And it's going to be a lot of hardware, a little bit of my, the little bit of the microcontroller and a little bit of figuring out how to use it to make a sine wave generator. So let's look first at the hardware. As you can see in the lower left hand corner, there's this weird array of resistors. And this array of resistors is called an R2R resistor array. And the idea here is that with this, you can, depending on how you set up the inputs on, as you see, R1, R2, R3, you can have a different voltage output over there on the left in parallel with the capacitor. So this is kind of a cool thing. And right now we have it set up with 1K and 2K resistors, the R being the 1K and the 2R being the 2K. And the way this works is, again, if you put in a high voltage on R1, you will have on the output VCC, in this case, 5 volts over 2. Whereas if you put a high voltage on R2 only, then that would be VCC over 4. And then if you put a high voltage across R3 specifically, then you're going to have VCC over 8. Now, the interesting thing about this is that as you put a high voltage on each one of these, they sum up together. So if you have a high voltage on all of them, then you can get basically the full output, where if you don't have any voltage on any of them, you get a zero output. So with this, your output can be varying voltage levels. And that is going to be the key, the foundation piece of how we create a sine wave generator. One final thing about this R2R um, resistor network is right now we're only using three outputs because we only have three GPIOs that can do outputs. So that's all we can do. So two to the third equals eight. So we actually only have eight steps that we can do on this. Now, if you had a bigger microcontroller and you wanted more resolution, then you can basically theoretically go as much as you want to have a higher and higher resolution. But because we're using the PIC 10 F200, which only has the three, we're only going to have eight different levels, which is going to make it kind of ugly unless we do some special stuff. So let's discuss the shape of the sine wave. In an ideal situation, we'd basically just tell the microcontroller, okay, let's just do sine x and output the output. But we can't do that. We, we don't have enough power to do those sort of mathematical calculations on here. So Sergey, when he was putting this together, he just did it all manually. He went in and he figured out, okay, how would we make something that looks vaguely sine wave shape and put it in an Excel spreadsheet and then calculated all of those values and figured out exactly what we would have to do to get a sine wave output with this thing. So on the table that he created, you can see it's pretty straightforward. You have the number of samples on the far left and then the amount of time and then sine t so you can get exactly where the value would be at that point in the sine wave. And what that is equivalent to with a DAC value because as we're doing this, we're basically just faking a digital to analog conversion here. And then in the very last thing, it's the register. So that is what in our uh, in our code is going to be um, what we have to access to create the value that we need. And then the register value is basically, as you can see, we're just counting up and we start at register 10 because that's the beginning of the registers that we can access. And then we start putting in those DAC values in those registers. And then using indefinite addressing, we can then just access register 10, output that, access register 11, output that, and it makes things a lot simpler. So that is why, since we do a lot of the uh, a lot of the work here in the hardware and a lot of the work beforehand, our, our program is pretty simple. So let's actually jump right into the software really quick. And you can tell, like, compared to the last ones we've been doing that have been hundreds of lines of code, this one's only 46 lines of code. And that includes the initialization and the end. And as you look at it, we have one through um, one through nine, which is just the setup again, and then have a couple spaces. But the, the heart of our code is basically 12 through 36. And all we're doing is we're saying, let's put these numbers into those registers that we've already calculated. So move literal to W4, and then we're moving the move at WF 10, 18, and we're just filling up all of those registers. And then we're looping in 38 through 44 to access those registers, increase. So we access register 10, we increase with increment to FSR, access the next one, increment, access the next one, and we just loop through as we do all of those registers and give the output that we want to. So I feel like I've been talking about a bunch of different random things here. And to put it all together, I really just want to show it in action. And so I have this all set up, I've already programmed it. And I have an oscilloscope and I want to go over the different outputs and the different portions of this two, two uh, excuse me, this R2R 
set up so you can see exactly what's happening at each level. Because again, at this point, if you've been going through the tutorials, this code should seem very, very straightforward, so I don't want to spend any more time on it. But the hardware is quite interesting. And as I mentioned with R1, if you, uh, whatever its output is, is going to cause the final output to be half of VCC. So let's look at what the output of R1 is. And you can see it's just a square wave because that's all we're doing in our code is saying this pin goes high or low. And that's actually fairly regular. Whereas if you look at other ones like R2, it's at a higher frequency and it's a little bit less regular. So let's, uh, I'm doing my stuff wrong here. Holy cow, I'm still doing my stuff wrong. Oh uh, yeah, this is kind of ugly. But you can still see the way that, there we go, that looks a lot better. You get a bigger, then a smaller, then a down. So you're having something a little bit less regular. And then on your final input, it's even at a higher frequency. Wow, that's pretty terrible. But again, it's at a higher frequency and it is also causing the smallest amount of change in the voltage output. So those are pretty straightforward. Those are just different ways of looking at a, uh, what's a variety of square waves. But now look at this. This is the first place where you're starting to see them being added together. I'm having some serious regrets here on how I set this up. So this is pretty funny. This almost looks like something musical. The way this is drooping, coming up and going down, and you're seeing a vague sinusoidal output there. And that's just at the first stage. And then we go to the next stage, and we are seeing a much more clear sinusoidal shape, but still has a bunch of crazy weird stuff right there, before going to the next stage, which now that almost kind of looks like a sinusoid. You get steps up and down, and all like that, but you can definitely see that sinusoidal shape. And then finally, we have the, res uh, the capacitor on the output, and this is what smooths it all out. And look at that, that actually looks like a real sine wave. It's kind of crazy. When, I when Sergey put this together and I put this up, I was blown away by how much this is a beautiful sine wave. Now, we put in a 6.8 nanofarad capacitor, and the reason we did that is because if you have too small of a capacitance, then basically it's just going to look like this. So the less capacitance you have, the more it's going to look like this with all of the jagged edges. But the bigger capacitor, and it starts acting like a rectifier, and you just get a DC output. So as Sergey was testing it, as he went above 6.8 nanofarads, it was even smoother. But the problem was is that instead of getting the peaks and the valleys, it was starting to shrink down quite a bit. And again, if you get a big enough capacitor, it's just going to be a flat DC, rather nice looking DC output. But that's not what we want. We want this sine wave. And so that, that's basically it. Now there's a couple of problems with this. Since we have 1K and 2K resistors in here, if you put something in parallel with this capacitor, some sort of uh, relatively low impedance load, it's gonna mess all of this up. It's gonna make it just not work at all. However, if you do have a low impedance load and you can't get away with that, you can just set up an, an emitter follower or some sort of op amp um, voltage follower to make it so you take that uh, this high impedance output and make it so it can actually work with a low impedance output. But if you have something that's pretty high impedance like this oscilloscope, you can hook directly to this and it works great. So that's basically it. I mean, uh, again, the majority of the issue, um, the majority of the challenge here is with the hardware and figuring out what those values are going to be in the software. But you can do that just by doing some simple calculations, throwing it in Excel, and just plugging it all in. And you can get what is an incredibly low, co low cost and very simple sine wave converter. Now, we have all of this code on circuitbread.com so that you can go and you can plug this in. And we highly recommend as homework to mess with these parameters. See if you can make this a faster, slower sine wave. See if you can make it uh, different shapes, things like that. And I think that way you'll get a more intuitive feel of what's going on. Because again, it's not the code that's the challenge here. It is figuring out the different values and figuring out how to change all that stuff. So that's it. I hope this helped. I hope this was real, really interesting. I found it fascinating. Uh, this was a really unique tutorial for me to go through and to learn about and to practice with Sergey. So I hope you also found it fascinating. If you did, give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and we will catch you in the next one.